NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. Hello, hello, hello! As you know, April is National Poetry Month, and we wouldn't have it any other way than to offer another episode of The Right Time, bringing together incredible educators, lovers of writing, authors, and the National Writing Project community. I'm Brian Ripley Crandall, and I get a little too excited when celebrating poetic possibilities, especially while featuring an, an incredible, incredible, outstanding, brilliant, wonderful project we are featuring tonight. As always, it is wonderful to be together with my friend across the United States, West Coast, Tanya Baker, Director of National Programs, where we will bring forward another conversation we know will be very important to our listeners. What's on your mind, Tanya? Well, Brian, as you know, many of my favorite shows happen when we bring poets into the studio and have the opportunity to listen to their work, their collaborations, and their writing processes. I was super excited when you let me know that a teacher leader from your site was actively involved with the Furious Flower Syllabus Project, begun at the Furious Flower Poetry Center at James Madison University, our nation's first academic center for Black poetry. Tonight's guests are with us as part of their mission to ensure the visibility, inclusion, and critical consideration of Black poets in American letters, as well as in the whole range of educational curricula. With us tonight are Dr. Aliyah Abdullah Mata, Hayes Davis. We don't, I did I miss somebody. Hayes oh, Davis. McKinley Melton. Thank you, I don't have that McKinley in my Melton. notes. McKinley, I'm so sorry. And NWP teacher leader, Dave Woolley. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, well, I want to say that it is my fault because I had McKinley Melton and I get to introduce him and I forgot to add him in Tanya's line. So I'm going to do it right now. It is my privilege to introduce the team. McKinley E. Melton earned his Ph.D. from the W.E.B. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Prior to joining the Gettysburg College faculty, Dr. Melton was a visiting assistant professor of literature at Hampshire College from 2007 to 2012. He is also the recipient of the 2015 Career Enhancement Fellowship for junior faculty from the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation and was a 2015 and 2016 postdoctoral fellow at the Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry at Emory University. Most recently, Dr. Melton, was awarded a 2019-2020 Frederick Burkhart Fellowship by the American Council of Learned Societies in order to support a year as a scholar in residence at the Furious Flower Poetry Center at James Madison University. Wow. Yeah, we got an impressive crew today. No kidding. We are in the presence of greatness as usual, Brian. Uh, Dr. Leah Abdulamada is a professor poet and professor of English at CUNY LaGuardia, where she teaches composition, literature, creative writing, and women, gender, and sexuality studies courses. She writes about the culture and history of Black women and explores the presence of Black bodies and voices in fine art and poetry. She was the co-recipient of the Jerome Lowell De Jour Prize in Poetry in 2018 from the City College of New York. Her poetry has been published in Newton Literary, Promethean, Marsh Hawk Review, Mom Egg Review, Vox, Globes, Global City Review, and the Jam Journal issue of Push Pull. Her chapbooks, Washed Clean and Blues Politico, were published by Harlequin Creature. <clears throat> Abdullah Mata has published critical and pedagogical articles and serves on the Radical Teacher and Women's Studies Quarterly editorial boards. She's working on a collection of poems inspired by archival and field research in South Carolina and Georgia, funded by a CUNY Resi grant. National Writing Project family, we're bringing everybody to the house tonight. These people are incredible. <laughs> Writers, scholars, thinkers, beautiful poets. Here we go. Hayes Davis, first volume, Let Our Eyes Linger, was published by Poetry Mutual Press. He is currently serving as the Howard County, Maryland, Poetry and Literature Society writer in residence, and he won a 2022 Maryland State Arts Council Independent Artist Award. His work has appeared most recently on the Academy of Poets 
Paul Madej feature. He has been anthologized, and this is what America looks like. Deep beauty, furious flowers, seeding the future of African-American poetry, ghost fishing, an echo justice poetry anthology, and others. My book list is going to be enormous after this show. His poems have not have also appeared in Mom Egg Review, New England Review, Poet, Alor, uh, Auburn Avenue, Gargoyle, Kinfolks, Fledgling Rag, and other journals. He holds a Master's of Fine Arts from the University of Maryland and is a member of Cave Canem's Cave Ka Ka Nim. There I Cave Canem. Look at I I got it wrong and then I got it right. First cohort of fellows. He has attended our or been award writing residencies at Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, the Hermitage, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, VCCA, Manhattanville College, and Soul Mountain. He has appeared on the Kojo Namandi Show on WAMU 88.5 in Washington, D.C., and at the Hay Festival Kells in Kells, Ireland. He has also taught English and directed equity and justice work in Washington, D.C. area independent schools for 20 plus years. He shares his creative and domestic life with his wife, poet Terry Ellen Cross Davis and their children, who he is also feeding as this show goes on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is my pleasure to, inter to introduce um, our interviewer for tonight, Dave Woolley. Dave is an English journalism and creative writing teacher at West Hill High School in Stamford, Connecticut, where he has taught since 2001. He has served as a co-advisor for the school's hybrid newspaper, The West Word, since, since 2003. He has served as an adjunct professor at Fairfield University, teaching philosophy of hip-hop, and he is teaching fellow at the Connecticut Writing Project. Dave is one of the one half of the rep group oh no the cypher knots <laughs> and a hip-hop educator who has presented at the hip-hop ed conference the nct and ncte annual conference the cspa conference among others he served as a curriculum and music coordinator for the national endowment for the humanities from harlem to hip-hop african-american history literature and song which was hosted at fairfield university dave is a contributing poet to the website ethical ela and he has been involved with the Furious Flower Center for Black Poetry as a participating scholar in its last three legacy seminars. He is one of the authors of the Furious Flower's newly created open access syllabus, Opening the World of Black Poetry, a Furious Flower Syllabus. He lives so I want to talk a little, little bit about human togetherness here. And because I work so closely with Dave and Dave's been working on the Furious Flower Poetry Project, I was like, this is a natural fit to the National Writing Project Network. And I was like, we need to do a show. And I was so thankful to my colleague, you know, Tanya. Thank you for having this come forward so that we can share it with the beautiful teachers that we work with across the nation, but also a lot of the scholars that I think pick up our show to learn new things about writing instruction and writing. So Dave, we get to hand it over to you. Nice. Dave, I think you're gonna get us started in National Writing Project fashion with a writing prompt. We won't actually stop and write here tonight, but if you're listening to a recording of this, you might want to hit pause after you hear Dave's very enticing invitation to write. All right. So I'm so happy to be with everybody here uh, during National Poetry Month. Um, and here we go in, in National Writing Project style. We uh, always start with a little bit of writing. So uh, the poet Major Jackson contributed an essay to the Furious Flower Anthology entitled My Lyrical Self. Um, as we get started, I want everyone to take a moment to reflect upon their own selfhood. Um, why do we do the things that we do? What, why do we do the things that make us who we are? Why do we teach if we're teachers? Uh, just to think about purpose today and, and, and maybe in particular, what purpose and role does Black poetry have in our classrooms? So as we consider these questions, uh, I want us to write in the style of Major Jackson's poem. It's a list poem, Why I Write Poetry. Uh, I'd love you guys to, to have a chance to write your own list poem. Uh, with why I statements and because statements. So try to come up with five or so because statements uh, that speak to your why. And I'm going to just read a couple lines of the poem so you guys get an idea of what we're talking about. So Major Jackson, why I write poetry? Because my son is as old as the stars. Because I have no blessings. Because I hold tangerines like orange tennis balls. Because I sit alone and welcome mornings across the unshaved jaws of my lawn. 
because the houses on my street sleep like turtles because the proper weight of beauty was her eyes last night beneath my eyes. Oh, gorgeous. All right. Show's all yours. You have a great conversation. We'll be back in a little while. Enjoy. Perfect. So I'm so happy to be back, uh, you know, in space with everybody. It's good to see all your faces. Um, we had such a great time writing this over the summer. There was such great fellowship among everybody. Um, and it's great to be back uh, in the company of fine, wise elders. Aliyah, I know you can relate to that. So um, I'm just going to jump in with a couple of questions for everybody. There's really no format. Anybody can answer. Uh, if there's anything that's kind of pointed in a direction, I'll, I'll, I'll do that too. So first, um, in that initial writing activity, uh, I wanted a little bit of reflection about our lyrical selves. I'm um, thinking about the Furious Flower syllabus. There was a it was a collaborative process, right? There were over 20 of us together, poets and teachers and 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 professors, academics. Um, how were you all able to bring your own lyrical selves, your own voice into that project? And then, like as you did that, what was your why as you approached writing the syllabus? So I guess anyone can jump in on that. I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, bringing my whole self to that project was easy um, because uh, number one, like if you if you ask me what my favorite thing to do in the world is, one, or for a list of them, right? One of those things is going to be writing a poem. And because there's no other feeling I get in any other activity that mirrors that almost out of body experience when the poem, you know, when the poem is really flowing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just, it's just, it feels like it's coming out of me without even me trying necessarily. And I knew that I was stepping into a space where I could be that full self. So I can't, I can't just drop everything and write a poem at work. I can't drop everything and write a poem as I'm teaching. I can't drop everything. Right. But I felt, but I, I, I knew I was entering a space with other poets who might share that, that that feeling of what poetry means to them. I knew I was entering a room of scholars. I knew I was entering a room of people who had been in care of Fury's Flower. Um, and so it just, I knew that I could bring my full self into that space. And it was, it was easy to be my full lyrical self in that space. Mm -hmm. Aliyah, you wanna hop in maybe? Yeah. Um... So it's so interesting, right? Because it, I definitely felt like it was a space where I could be bring all of myself, right? My my black woman self, my educator self, my poet self, my um, and my uh, myself around, you know, being engaged with the discipline. So it just felt really um, felt like a really whole space, if that makes a sense. And and I realized in being a part of that, that um, that I am not often in those kinds of spaces, right? Because like Hayes is saying, we like kind of compartmentalize ourselves in terms of work and poetry. Um, the why for me was, was because um, I wanted to be able to contribute to the kind of curriculum that I want out here, right? Like um, as a person who's done black studies, literature and culture, and, and I'm in a, in a, you know, and I'm at a community college, right? It's just very difficult to get all of that in this, in the classroom space with the other things that we have to do. So it just felt really significant and important for me um, to be a part of that. And to also, you know, just really connect with other folks who are engaged and really believing in and loving black poetry. Nice. So I will, I will say, I mean, I, I was sitting here just listening to these answers like, oh, wait, no, I have to answer. I'm just want to listen <laughs> and learn and, and loving this. So, you know, my, my role in this was, I felt like it was a little bit different, um, largely in that um, most of my role for the week was I was really the convener. Um, and I worked with a group, you know, I was really excited about a lot of the materials that we were able to put together. Um, but I was kind of coming at this week and coming at this project from my role as the as the chair of the Furious Flower Advisory Board. And so I was kind of wearing a, a, a sort of an administrative hat while at the same time really trying to think about what I was looking for out of this project um, that had been kind of conceived by the advisory board and that we had certain objectives and goals. But then I was also just 
as a lover of literature and language and poetry and as a scholar, as a teacher, I just found myself being able to kind of, I came in thinking I was going to come in to keep everybody on track and be, you know, I was going to be the structure, but then I just found myself kind of letting go into the structure um, and, and really taking that moment to feel the power of what we had been able to convene that week. Um, and also being able to kind of, let go of some of my own rigidity and make space for for dance breaks in the week because you know some of our participants said we need we need we need to get up we need to move we need to do some other things um and so i think that that was that was for me um really a beautiful part of the experience was to be surrounded by all of these brilliant minds intellectuals scholars teachers artists who were all bringing everything they were bringing into the space, which made it easier for me to let go and bring what I needed to bring into um, into that space as well. And I think that in terms of my why, I mean, ultimately the why for this project was also, it was the why that the kind of board had pulled together, but it was also for me deeply personal. Um, you know, I, I've known Aaliyah for for over over 20, <clears throat> over 20 some odd years at this point. Um, and uh, she will tell you that when, when we first met, I used to say, oh, I don't like poetry. You know, Aaliyah liked poetry. I was like, no, I like prose. I like novels. I like short story. Like, don't give me any of that poetry. And it really was for me an evolution of realizing that I thought I didn't like poetry and I realized I just hadn't been reading the right poems. Um, and so this project was, I thought, speaking to a person like me who was a lover of literature and a scholar of literature and a scholar of, of Black studies and Black expression who had just kind of drawn this little box around this area that was kind of like, you know, not to be ventured into, right? And I think that part of what this project does is it is designed for people who think they don't like poetry or they don't do poetry or they don't get poetry. And sometimes that's the students in our classes. And sometimes it's us as educators who don't want to teach poetry because we don't feel comfortable. And so that was that kind of multi-pronged process that I was hoping. And I'm really excited that I think we were able to produce something that is for people who have been working in poetry for decades and people who have been running from it for decades. There's something for them, you know, in this project for all of them. Yeah. Yeah, there was that, that sense of collaboration that, that was going on during during the Institute was just incredible, right? There was just so much synergy in the room. Then the curation of the space was so important, you know, the, the ability for us to get up and and mix up groups and 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 work with different people was uh I think really lent a lot to what what ended up being the the final product. So McKinley, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote you actually. Uh you and Lauren wrote the introduction to the syllabus, Lauren, the, the director of the Furious Flower Institute. Um, and you you guys wrote, uh, our focus was on accessibility and empowerment. This would be a free resource and one that would be useful to educators working on all levels and in all contexts. We wanted to provide tools for anyone who wanted to engage the work of Black poets. So then to you first, Melton, but then to, to everyone, um, how does the syllabus work towards that mission? Um, in what ways can the syllabus help to facilitate the teaching of Black poetry in, in the classroom? Well, I mean, I'll say, you know, we've referenced a couple of times the idea of the the kind of the, the number of collaborators that we had in the room. And I think that that is, for us, that was the, that was the start, right? We really thought about who are going to be the people that we're going to convene to come in and to put this work together. And we really thought about what are the different perspectives that are going to go into the creation of this so that it will be available to the different audiences that we're trying to reach. So we had folks who had experience teaching at all levels of the curriculum. We had folks who said, well, what group do you want me in? Because I've taught K-12, I've taught college, I've done a graduate seminar, I'm doing a community workshop next week, right? So we had people who came in understanding, I'm working on materials for an intro to undergraduate poetry course, but here's how this could be adapted for a high school. This is how this could be adapted for, you know, a community center, boys and girls club, right? That folks came to the work thinking about, we want this to be usable. We want it to be adaptable. And just because we're targeting it for one group doesn't mean we want it to be limited to one group. And I think that that sentiment and that spirit really came into the work. And I think it shows up when you look through this document and you, you see the ways that this work is it's scalable and it's adaptable, right? Which also goes back to that idea of it being a free and open resource, right? We wanted to know that this care went into this, 
precision and thoughtfulness went into this, but it's not locked down into what it is, right? You can take this, you can adapt it, you can excerpt it. If you only want to use one exercise and not a five-day unit plan, you can do that. So we really wanted that idea of adaptability and scalability um, to, to be one of the hallmarks of, of the project. And I think the people we brought together to contribute to it came to that work with that, with that in mind. All right. Hayes, you want to jump in maybe? Yeah, to build on that, I think um, the thing that stands out to me about the syllabus project, um, a couple of things. Number one, to go back to our first answer, I, the thing that I that I realized as I could, as we left the space and as I and as I and as I as I continued to process this space, I realized that here was a room of 20, 25 academics, mostly, who were at the end of the school year. And yet we brought so much energy to that week because the work was so deeply fulfilling. And the work was deeply fulfilling because the thing that stands out to me about the Furious Flower anthology, this most recent one, but all three of them, um, is the um, full-bodied humanity that is on display in those anthologies. And if you take it, if we sort of take this back to the reason black people are in America to begin with, right? Was built on a lack of personhood. It was built on a lack of agency, a lack of reading, a lack of um, rights, a lack of anything, a lack of everything that makes a person a full human. And yet here is this full-bodied, full-blooded humanity on display in the syllabus project. And you can't help but, I'm sorry, in, in, the, in the anthology and building the syllabus project, we can't help but bring that humanity to the page. And therefore to the students who are going to be um, encountering this work. And so that's that's what stands out to me both about the anthologies and about the syllabus project itself. Yeah. Ali, do you want to add? Um, well, the first thing I want to say is what they said, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, I think that for me, it's also this way, one, to make the materials much more accessible to folks who might not otherwise you know, have be able to say order the full anthology and have students, you know, purchase those things. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is the, the the and it was kind of mentioned already, but I think it's important to reiterate the ways in which it's across many teaching and learning levels. I mean, that's really phenomenal, right? That you could take a lesson from K through, you know, not K, well, say middle school, high school, whatever, and adapt it up or adapt it down. I thought I think that was really important. And I think that it works well for two populations, right? It works well for the folks who have a handle on the discipline, but it also works well for folks who do not, that they can find this self-contained, you know, uh, these units and lesson plans that they can process from step one through step whatever to, to complete it. And it can ground them in the material in ways that I think a lot of folks are not always sure about teaching poetry or even teaching black poetry. And I think that um, I just want to reference my own environment here. So I distributed the syllabus to folks in the department and they're like, oh my God, like this is what we need. Like something that I can just grab a piece if I want to include it in my larger introduction to literature course. So I think that's that's also a really significant thing. So I call it like these kind of micro or larger um, units of study that are possible there. And it's also just well thought out. There are resources there. You can click here, click there, find this, find that. So it really gives you all of that in a very contained space. And I, and I think it, you know, uh, I think it's a really important, um, you know, body of curriculum, if I could say it that way. Yeah. Yeah, you all are, you all are uh, anticipating my questions as you, as you go through your answers, which is great. By the way, this is the, this is the actual anthology that the syllabus is based on. Um, you know, one of the things that, that is interesting about this anthology you know, especially as compared to the other two, is it, it really kind of foregrounds the work of contemporary poets. So these are, you know, these poems are, they feel new, they feel fresh. Um, do, was, do you think that there are things that teachers will be able to benefit from in the classroom 
by working off of the poems in this anthology and using the poets from this anthology. I guess that could go out to, you know, whoever wants to jump in on that. Hey, okay. you're, you're you're in the anthology oh. for one. I, I'll just I'll 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 start with answering my own question for a minute. But uh, Hayes, your your poem in particular, right, is 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 really uh, preaching at the moment because of the James book that just came out. So you have that poem that speaks of uh, to Jim on the raft, right? So it's a a retelling of of, a, of one of the excerpts from Huck Finn, but it, it foregrounds the voice of Jim, right? So it it kind of it decenters Huck and centers centers around around Jim's humanity, which I think is it's it's a brilliant poem. So, but yeah, so so maybe you go, you guys could elaborate on that a little bit. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, first of all, shout out to Percival Everett. Um, I I said to Terry, I'm I'm not the fastest reader, and I finished James in about 36 hours. I said, Terry, have you ever seen me read a book that quickly? It's really, 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 just great piece of work. Um, especially if you know the book Huck Finn well, and I've taught it many, many times. Um, but I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Because <laughs> I yeah, there... I, I, I guess the question is since it's a it's a book that really focuses on the uh, the anthology works with contemporary poets, a lot of younger poets, um, and and the poems are most of them have been written fairly recently. Um, how how could that be a benefit for for classroom teachers if they wanted to bring that into their classroom? Yeah, well, I mean, one of um, you know uh, one of the items in my bio, I'm, uh, I'm currently serving as um, it's called uh, Hoko Polizzo, the Howard County Poetry and and Literature Society um, writer in residence, and I go into schools and do visits with high schoolers, and the whole idea behind this position is that students respond well to living poets who are right there in front of them. And in fact, you know, a lot of the feedback from the students was, it was nice to hear a poet read their own work. And so what we've got in this, in the anthology is these poets who are, as you said, out there and out there in the world right now and out there in the world online. So, you know, the, um, the lesson, one of the lessons that I worked on, we've got two different recordings of the of of the poems that are in that lesson that students can can watch, right? So I think so much so much of what is valuable about this syllabus project in the classroom is the wealth of online resources, the ways that we are able to, um, because I've done this too, right? I I taught my unit in my class because I kind of had to, right? Um, so I was able to bring the poems off the page for students in a way that makes them even more interested in the poems. Oh, that's what that poet looks like. Oh, that's what it sounds like. Oh, that's how she she read that line. Oh, that's how they, um, that's how, you know, just any anything about a poem that comes off, that that comes from a, from a live performance or from a recording of the poem, that's what's so valuable is how much the anthology lives. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just add to that because it, it's true this way in which um, students today need to hear from poets who are still living, teaching, writing, and working poets that they're so, and you know, and, and you already mentioned the, the availability of them digitally. I think that's very, through video, YouTube, et cetera, is really important. But also I think the ways in which these poets address contemporary issues that students can witness in our society right now. So, you know, all this, these politics around race, class, gender, sexuality, family and communal identities, the effect of black criminality, police violence. And I could go on with the list, right? Of all the anti everything um, that's mm -hmm. up now. So it really, they feel really timely. Um, and our students, right, can just can can really Google and find these people, and and then can relate to the things that they're talking about. It really makes puts poetry at the center of you know contemporary society in a very important way. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull an Aaliyah and be like what they said for starters, right? <laughs> right. But I mean, I think that 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 point about um, the kind of aliveness 
is really important. Um, you know, I'm currently this semester, I'm teaching uh, literature of the civil rights movement and I'm teaching a seminar on James Baldwin. And I'm constantly, you know, joking to the students, like imagine a moment where this was relevant, right? Where this was, where voting rights were actually on the table, right? Where, you know, uh, being openly queer was actually a problem, right? And I, I talk to them about the idea that we are reading these texts that are mid 20th century texts and they remain relevant, right? And I think that that's a big part of my work and a big part of what I work to do is to help them understand the relevance of things that, you know, for all intents and purposes were 100 years ago as far as they're concerned, right? Or the late uh, 20th century as they often will refer to the 1990s. Um, but the um, the idea that that there is some value in finding the relevance in older work but also there's value in recognizing that the work is not just frozen in 1955 or 1963, right? That yeah. there are, that there is a conversation and a dialogue between Dominique Christina in 2024 and James Baldwin in 1964, right? That there are ways for them to really think through what does it mean to pick up this very alive poem, right? That you are now able to read a poem by Hayes Davis in relationship to a novel by Percival Everett that's a commentary on a novel by Mark Twain, right? Like, what does it mean to really think about not just making old things relevant, but also recognizing that that relevance persists enough that new work is still being created that is in conversation with the things that were written 100 years ago, 150 years ago, 200 years ago? And, and, and what does that kind of offer us as a commentary to really think about what these works are commenting on, right? That they remain persistent because these issues and these concepts and these challenges remain consistent. And what does it mean that a poet in 2024 is still working to articulate a humanity that was robbed from this community in, in 1624, right? Like what does it mean to really think about what does that engender, right, in terms of a conversation to say, yes, we do still have a poem that was written last year that feels like it could have been in conversation with Hughes and Douglas and Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, right? What does that invite us to really consider? And I think that that's, there's beauty in that. Right. Yeah, uh, and and some of these poems are just actively in conversation with the past too. So, so there's that as well, you know, uh, this, uh, some that are, Based on historical documents, uh, it's such a it's such a rich collection. Um, I know right now I'm I'm doing uh, I'm I'm working on a lesson about the uh, geniusing a poem, so so I'm doing that with uh, with ninety poems I didn't write about you, the poem that was written for Jasmine Richards. Um, so I, so my kids are actively like kind of researching the uh, the connections between like you know Aaliyah is mentioned in that poem and. Um, uh, Angela Davis is mentioned in the poem. So you have all these incredible reference points that kind of smudge temporal lines and, and you know, historical lines and, and, and really kind of bend and fold time and, and experience, which is, I think, exactly kind of what you were talking about, uh, McKinley. Um, to that end, is there anything that, that you've had an opportunity to, this, to end anyone again, had an opportunity to work with in, from the syllabus in your own classrooms? Hayes, I heard you talking a little bit about the the lessons that you wrote. Was that the the uh, the uh, the food the food uh, um, individual? Actually, no. Mine. Uh, this was the main the the food one. I think was was a uh, um was one of those when we mixed it up and you worked with some other people beside your core group. I taught the lesson that um uh that um Brian Hannon and uh, T J. Um, whose last name is escaping me right now. McKinley helped me out. Um, Brian and TJ and Terry and I worked with, on with um, Mary Beth Cancien, um, mm -hmm. individual and collective identities in the poems of Safia El Hio. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to gaff the other name, but anyway. Um, yeah. So, so we, um, that was um, teaching that was, phenomenal can you repeat the question again i'm sorry i'm i'm sorry i did i i have so many thoughts in my head right now and i apologize that i keep not bringing the question into no, my no, answer. It's good. The, the uh the question was uh, are there lessons that you've had the opportunity to bring into your classroom essentially yeah so so that lesson so i i i gave my um students um i 
we began the lesson as as the as the lesson is written, um, looking at looking at a flag. I asked them what's right, what what is this a flag? What's this the American flag? And we talked about pledging allegiance to a flag. And it was interesting because I teach at an independent school. There were there are students in, in my class who went to public school, and so they had the experience of standing up every day or not standing up every day, um, putting their hand over their heart and reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and then, you know, we went to the next step, which was to read the poem. And then I had them write their own um, pledge poem. So so it, it was it was a great way to invite students to bring themselves into the classroom, similar to the way in which we were able to bring our full selves to the project. For that moment of that poem, students are bringing it, their full selves. They are pledging allegiance to um, being on the sideline of a boyfriend's soccer game when his parents can't make it, or pledging allegiance to um, their grandfather's scattered ashes in the ocean. The ple their, their, their pledging allegiance to uh, my father's big nose and nappy hair, right? So taking, taking things that have been a deficit model for framing blackness and pledging allegiance to them, right? So um, yeah, that that I I I really enjoy the way that lesson invites students to bring themselves um, into into the into the classroom, and also it was just it was great to have a conversation about how we have this love-hate relationship with the country. This is a class of, of, of primarily Black students. Eight out of the 10 students in the class are Black. And what was interesting was as much of, as much, two things, as much as most of us said that living in this country can be difficult, um, I also, you know, when I said, but every four years, when the men's four by 100 <laughs> team from the U.S., is on the blocks who am I rooting for? And everybody was not there. It's like, yeah, we're all rooting for, for our country in the Olympics. And then there was the one student who um, who came to the US. Um, his family is Iranian. And so he had a he has a different relationship with the flag. He loves the flag. It was a really wonderful moment of sort of um, you know, a moment when one student's experience can really deepen the conversation. So so here we are sort of agreeing with each other around how the country can be difficult. And here's this other student who's like, nah, I kind of love it here. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a really great lesson because again, as I said before, full bodied, full, full blooded humanity was, was on display there. Nice. So I'm, I'm getting the, I'm getting the, the signal from Brian that there's time for, for just one more question. Uh, so I, I, I'll, I'll preface it by, by, by saying this. Is it McKinley, is it Cento or Cento? I don't think we ever came to consensus about that. Is it both? It's both. Okay. Uh, one of the cool things I had an opportunity to do with in my own classroom uh, over the course of the year, and this is from taken from the syllabus, is uh, I was teaching a creative writing class, and it was... Uh, English language learners. So really, English English was a second language for everybody in there. Um, so I was able to use poems taken from the anthology um, and have kids experience poems and then take home a little packet and pick a line from any one of the poems. And they came in with, they came in with, a you know, their line from the poem. And then we assembled and created a chento for the classroom. Um, and that was really taken from the chento that we did over the summer uh, when we all when we all had to come up with a line from from uh, from the anthology and and compile it as a poem, it was a great it was a great activity. The kids were really proud of what they they put together, especially because some of them barely spoke a word of English. So it was exposing them to something that you know that that made things a little bit more accessible for them and allowed them to experience you know an experience that they might not have otherwise had through this poetry. So. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys, what was your line for the Cento, and, and um, how did that, how how did the the activity of collaboration and coming together and that and putting that Cento to speak to what went on in the in the uh, in the syllabus project? I don't know if you guys will remember it. 
maybe. So I I did look it up first, <laughs> but <laughs> I will say I would I wouldn't say I would have remembered the line offhand, but I remember the story of the line. Yes. Um, but uh, so my line was, "Justice is not a pendulum. It is not a hammer. It is not a bandage." And that is actually a line from Let My Anger Be the Celebration We Were Never Supposed to Have, which is uh, Natasha Alodicone. Um, And so I, I, when we decided we were doing this, I just started kind of going through the book and I was reading through and that line just jumped out at me and I said, oh, this is my line, absolutely. Um, and the thing about it that was really kind of... Um, Wonderful is that I joined with Maida Duewa Jones to actually put the the Cento together. So we had collected everyone's lines, um, and we were kind of we were going about the work of figuring out what was the order and how did we want to build this out and how did we want this to to look. And you know, Maita and I were talking and realized well we never actually got a line from Lauren Elaine right because she's you know the executive director of Furious Flower. We said well. We want her involved in this. I mean, you know, she's been, you know, there with the center, even though she's not doing this work with us with the syllabus building, right? She's she's here and we don't want to leave her voice out. And so we just sent her a text and said, listen, we need a line from you. We want to make sure that you're represented in the Cento. And she sent the same line. So um, it's the only line in the poem that repeats. Every other line is distinct, and that's the one line that comes twice. And uh, Lauren and I just kind of laughed about it with this idea that we had just been in sync, sharing sharing brain cells, you know, all um, all week. And it was just another testament to like, yeah, no, we are we are in this together. And that was before we even decided to co-write the introduction. We were still pulling things together, but it was just like we are. We are we were speaking each other's language all week. And so that for me was a really beautiful thing. The idea that without talking with one another, we, you know, this anthology of almost 300 pages worth of poetry, we both seized on the same exact line. And so that was really kind of uh, that was really a beautiful moment for me. That's great. That's great. Ali, do you remember yours? Uh, well, no, I had to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> just thank God all this is digital. Cause I said, what was it? What was it? Where was it? And I didn't have it marked in my book, but mine was the red doves tumbling from the torsos and the bodies. And that was from, um, who is that from? So Preacher's Crow, Preacher Crow's Sermon on the Ark of Bones um, by Dexter L. Booth. And I think I just loved the, the concrete abstractness of it like red doves tumbling from the torso the bodies and just really um it it made me think of something that was physically happening but also something that abstractly doesn't make sense which you know we know that the, a lot of the experience to black bodies in the U.S. are you know um the abstractly don't make sense but physically these things happen so I think it, it came to me in that way um, and I taught this a lot, like just having my students create gentle poems, but to actually do one myself with, with folks, that was a first for me. So it was just an amazing experience. Yeah. Hayes, I saw you scrambling. Were you grabbing, uh, who were you grabbing the line? <laughs> I was, I was, I was grabbing the line. And so here's the thing. I, I know the poem it comes from. I know the line I think it is. Um, I just chatted McKinley. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is that line. Um, so this is from um, And More Black by Ty Freedom Ford. Um, Ty, I met Ty at uh, Manhattanville College at a three-day residency, um, probably like almost 10 years ago, eight years ago now. Um, huge fan of Ty's work. Um, what Ty does with sound, what Ty does with um, just with lyricism. Um, and so the line is um, pump fake and fast break must be breakfast brown. And I just, I loved, I loved um, the the assonance of the fake and break. I loved the alliteration um, of the breakfast and brown. Um, and I wanted to give, it's 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 not the easiest line to fit into a cento. So I thought I'd, you know, give you a little bit of a challence of where do we put yeah. breakfast in this? It was, <laughs> in this it was a, those were late nights putting that together at McKinley Ward. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was a very late night, but it was it was an amazing experience. Yeah. Well, the hard work is obvious to Tanya and I and will be obvious to the entire network when they actually get to see this show. Um, I, I texted Tanya. I said, do you want to take a, a, a stab at writing a two voice poem answering Dave's question? 
Um, Tanya, do you have it up? Can you see the lines at the bottom? I didn't see where you put your lines. I have my lines though, so. Okay, so here we go. Rather, but... I'll go one and then you go one. So we're gonna take the this, why we love this work, right? So why we love this work? We love this work because we believe in growing the full body, full blooded humanity, humanity in it all, sharing this room of scholars, educators, and lovers of real histories and living writers, Tanya. Uh, because we're drawn to stories of work, especially work done in community by folks who can and do bring their whole selves to the project at hand. We love this work because we see how the flowers bloomed furiously out of James Madison University and spread its intellectual seeds so we could pledge allegiance to the world we want to see. Because I want to spend my time among teachers who know that poetry is not frozen in time, pinned to the page, or locked behind glass, studied but never touched. Finally, we love this work for its care, its intentionality, and its versatility that just delivered its beauty through the woolly Abdullah Mata Melton haze that brings magic to our sometimes troubled days. Woo, 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 woo. Differently. Yeah. Because I only want to spend time with people who know and respect that great work requires dance breaks. Woohoo! Let's dance, everybody. Nice. All right. Nice. Dave, you have to do a Good closing stuff. prompt Good now. Stuff. Hold on okay. a second. I'll give him his. Uh, oh, God, don't look at my whole screen. Dave, a closing prompt for those who are listening. A closing prompt. So uh, if you can see this, there is an excerpt from the poem Food for Bonding. Um, the Food for Bonding lesson in the Furious Flower syllabus is built around Daryl Alejandro Holmes's poem, Bread Pudding Grandmama. So I invite everyone to reflect on the imagery and themes that are present in the excerpt. Think about how our classrooms are spaces of bonding, mentorship, and nourishment. And then using the imagery of food, write a classroom experience, write about a classroom experience that was nourishing or one that left you hungry for something more. Oh. Poems are encouraged, but any writing is good. Well, we thank you. Excellent. Anya, wow. Yeah, I, this is beautiful. I'm so glad to have the show to be able to share your work with the whole National Writing Project. And I'm sure people are going to be eating this curriculum up. It is gorgeous. Just the taste we got tonight left me hungry for more, Dave. I can't wait to dig in. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for having us and for giving us the opportunity to share this work. And we just, you know, all we ask of folks, use it, use it freely and share it. Um, send it, send it to your friends, send it to your colleagues, share it with your students. Something tells me, McKinley, we're going to be hearing more and more and more about the Furious Flower Project. We are, we are. <laughs> We'll leave that for a future show. Uh, in the meantime, we'll be pushing the Furious Flower Project syllabus out widely on the National Writing Project Network. For those of you who are listening, thank you for being here. We will put links to the Furious Flower Project syllabus in the Right Now Teacher Studio where you can use it, download it, use it, and share it with other teachers who are there uh, working and sharing their work. You will want to sign up for NWP newsletter right now so that you never miss a show of an episode of the right time because we spend such time such great time with such excellent folks who do such beautiful work thanks everybody you're listening to nwp radio a production of the national writing project nwp nwp radio